Whenever the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, he led them to Mount Sinai, and there he met with them and gave them his law. And at that time, God came down upon the mountain with smoke and fire and thunderings and lightnings. And along with this awesome demonstration of his authority and power, he declared as he began to give those Ten Commandments, I am the Lord. We thought of that last week. I am Jehovah. I am the self-existent, the eternal, the unchangeable, the almighty God. And as Israel took in this dramatic evidence of who God is, one thing that was very clear to them at that mountain was that these commandments were not mere suggestions. God was setting forth authoritative commands. He was not giving them a gentle nudge in the right direction saying, you know, you might be a little better off if you do things this way. The God of all the earth met with Israel and he authoritatively commanded them. And one of the major differences, when you think about it, between a suggestion and a command is that a command is enforced. Commands carry a degree of threat, and and that's always the case. Uh, Unless there's some sort of penalty for disobedience, then you don't really have a command at all. I mean, imagine for a moment... In, if, if the police in Australia decided that they were never again going to prosecute someone for theft. Well, then you might have all sorts of laws in the book about theft, but effectively, theft might as well be legal because there's no consequence. It's not really a command anymore. It's not really anything that's binding. People can just do what they want, take it or leave it. No consequences. If there's no threat, if there's no penalty, then your command becomes really just a mere suggestion. Well, when God gave his moral law, there was threat with it, that there are consequences for disobedience and a legitimate threat. And as you come to Galatians chapter 3, you have that threat emphasized for us. And if you look at verse 13 and pick out just a few words, you'll notice it in that phrase, the curse of the law, the curse of the law. There's a curse. Now, the book of Deuteronomy gives us the record of Moses declaring the law again to Israel at the end of their 40 years in the wilderness, uh, just before before they go to possess the promised land. Uh, By the way, that book, Deuteronomy, gets its name uh, from uh, the Greek words deuteros, meaning second, and nomos, meaning law, second law, second giving of the law. Deuteronomy is Moses really giving Israel the law again before they enter into Israel, to, to the promised land. But as he does that, as he repeats the law, as he declares the way in which Israel are to obey their God, he comes near to the end. And in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, you read the warning. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And Paul quotes from that verse here in Galatians 3. There is a curse. There is a penalty for lawbreakers. There is a threat attached to the law. And so before we get into the specific commandments in the coming weeks, and at least my plan is to get into them fairly soon here, but before we get there, let's stop and consider this important topic, the curse of the law. Now, first of all, the meaning of this curse, the meaning. Uh, You'll notice in verse 10 that Paul speaks of the people who are under the curse. As many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. And we'll get into who these people are in a moment. But for now, take that phrase, under the curse. What does it mean to be under the curse of the law? Whenever you see the word curse, you might immediately think of maybe swear words, curse words. Uh, You might think of someone saying something insulting to another person. Or perhaps you might uh, have images of uh, a witch's incantation or spell or something of that nature. But when the Bible speaks of a curse, it's talking about more than just strong words, and it isn't just some mystical spell. You you know, in a basic sense, a curse in Scripture is opposite to a blessing. You can think of it that way. It's the opposite of blessing. In all sorts of ways, we receive blessing from God. Uh, Certainly, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have the blessing of salvation, and we have all the other blessings that go along with that, the blessing of being justified, forgiven, 
cleansed, adopted. We have, we have the blessing of the ongoing work of God in our lives, the blessing that we will ultimately be in glory with our Savior. We have blessings. In fact, even if we don't know the Savior, we're blessed in many ways. We have our lives here and now. We have all sorts of good gifts that go along with our lives. God has given us a lot. These blessings are things that God has bestowed upon us. Well, a curse is the opposite to that. A curse from God emphasizes these blessings all being stripped away. A moment ago, we quoted from Deuteronomy 27. Well, in the very next chapter, chapter 28 of that book, God declared in verse 15 that the curses that would come upon Israel for their disobedience. He said, these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And we're not really going through them all now, but a number of curses are listed there. And then verse 20 puts it like this. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing and vexation and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly. Now the Lord's speaking here of if the people disregard his law, if they stand before him as lawbreakers, he says, I will set my hand against you. I will, I will curse you in all that you set your hand to until you're destroyed, until you perish. The Lord went on to describe how through disease and famine and enemies, the people would be brought to death. And in various ways, all the things they had would be stripped away from them. Listen to what God says in verse 63 of that chapter, Deuteronomy 28. The Lord says, It shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. The basic idea then of being under the curse is that you are under the active, the destructive and legitimate judgment of God. The idea is that you are exposed to divine vengeance in all of its power and therefore every blessing that you have first received from the hand of God is taken away again and all good things are removed. That's the sense of it. Just like in Mark 11 when Christ cursed the leafy fig tree which had no fruit, and the very next morning the tree was dried up from its roots, every shred of life gone. So it is for those who remain under the curse of the law. We're being warned here about something very solemn, divine judgment, destructive judgment, utter desolation. If you look at Matthew 25, the Savior speaks about dividing men into two camps at the day of judgment. He's on the judgment seat and the people are divided into two. You have his people on the right hand and then you have the unsaved on the left. And the Lord says he will turn to those who are on the left hand side, these who are under the curse of the law. And in Matthew 25 and verse 41, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice Christ calls this camp the cursed. And what does it mean here for them to be cursed? Well, it means separation from God and from blessing. Christ tells them, depart. Depart. You could take in the language from other parts of the gospel. Depart into outer darkness. Depart from all the blessings of my presence. Depart from me. It involves here destructive torment because Christ tells them to depart into everlasting fire. It certainly means everlasting punishment because it is everlasting fire. It's the punishment that is already pronounced upon Satan and the demons for their rebellion. And the horrifying thing is that it is given to many uh, men too because there are many who are under the curse of the law. So as we come to Galatians 3 and we read about this curse, we ought to let the solemnity of it hit our hearts. And even for believers, I mean, let the solemnity of it hit your heart because it'll cause you to appreciate all the more what you have in Christ. Here's what could have come your way. Here's what does come your way if you are in the wrong position, which we'll see in a moment. 
What a solemn thing. If you're found with this curse, if you're found under the curse, if you receive it, then everything good which comes as a blessing from God will be removed. You'll be left with everlasting death and torment and horror and separation from God and from good. So how do you end up with this curse? How do you end up with this judgment from God upon you? Let's think about the receiving of this curse, the receiving of it. And uh, first of all, notice the system under which this curse is received. There's a system under which it is received. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is really addressing a very central question to the whole Christian faith and the Bible, and that is, how can we be made right with God? How can we approach God and have a good standing with the Lord? And as Paul answers that question right the way throughout the book of Galatians, he is contrasting two different and opposing systems, two different methods by which people try and come into God's presence. In verse 9, he mentions firstly about they which be of faith. And these ones are blessed with Abraham. Uh, Then in verse 10, as you have the other camp, as many as are of the works of the law. And these ones are under the curse of the law. And so here you have these two different ways by which people seek to draw near to God. There are those who come unto God by faith. These people approach God, resting in his promises, and especially the promise of salvation through Christ. In fact, if you look at verse 8, it tells us that the gospel was preached unto Abraham when, when God called Abraham to follow him. The gospel was being preached to him. God said that all the nations would be blessed through him, that is, through his seed, through his descendant, Christ. And we're being told this this gospel was being preached to Abraham, and he was blessed before God by faith in the gospel, by faith in Christ. That was the system that he used to draw near to God. He took God's word, and he rested in the promised Christ, and he was blessed. But then you have another system here in Galatians 3, those who try to approach God through the works of the law. And we ought to recognize that's, that's the default system for all of us. That's where we start as we enter this world. Uh, until you've come to personally trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is the system that you are using. You stand before God under the law and therefore under the curse of the law. Your default setting is that we come into this world without Christ and therefore having to earn our own way to God and trying to do it through law keeping by being a good enough person, by doing good things and not doing bad things. And this is the default setting for for all of us. We come into this world with this thinking, I will satisfy God by what I can do and by what I don't do. And you know, I suppose that's the same system with which we relate to the law of the land. You know, if I don't want to get into trouble with the Australian government, well, then I do the right things under the law and I avoid the wrong things. And if I don't do it, well, then I get what's coming to me. But if I want to stay on the right side of the Australian government, well, I, I keep the law. I, I obey it. Well, many take that approach when it comes to God. If I mainly do the right things and I avoid doing the wrong things, all will be right. And that seems to make sense to us. But, but notice verse 10. It is, it is precisely this system that leads to the curse. Those who try to approach God this way are said to be under the curse of the law. Now let me stress at the outset then, but before we go further in the series and consider the various commandments that God gives us, that throughout this series, the temptation will come to us, and even to believers to some extent, the temptation will come to us to hear the commands of God and to think of all that's stipulated there and to think to ourselves that if we listen to what we're being told and we do this thing and we don't do that thing, that somehow we will rise up the ladder and get closer to God. If, we're, if you're not saved, perhaps you're, you'll be tempted to think, right, well, if I obey these particular instructions, well, then that'll get me into God's favor. Or even for a believer, this works thinking can come into our hearts where we, we think to ourselves, well, if I do this thing and do that thing, well, then somehow I'll earn a bit more of God's love. God will favor me even more. 
That thinking is wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Paul is setting out here in Galatians 3 that the only thing that can be earned by us through the law is its dreadful curse. And why is that? Why does this system always lead to a curse? Well, we've thought about the system. Think about the shortcomings for which this curse is received. In verse 10, when Paul says that as many as are of the works of the law, the law are under the curse, he gives an explanation. He says, for it is written, cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The point is being set before us that the law only holds out an earned blessing if we keep the law perfectly. And in reality, we all fall very far short. Now, you could think about our shortcomings in terms of, firstly, completeness. Notice what it says there in verse 10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. You know, we often tell ourselves that we'll be okay before God as long as we keep most of the commands. As long as I do a fairly good job and keep most of it, God will probably let me off with a little bit. It'll not matter if I fail a little bit, as long as I've kept most of it, as long as I've, in the main, been okay. So we might tell ourselves, you know, if I keep nine out of the ten commandments, well, that one that I broke won't be too bad. But here we're being reminded, even if you just break one command, you're still a lawbreaker. You haven't kept all. You're still a lawbreaker and you receive the curse that belongs to lawbreakers. Now, on top of that, we often tell ourselves that we'll be okay as long as we keep the basic meaning of the commandment. You know, this is always the, the position we get to whenever we try to please God by our works. We always have to make excuses for ourselves. We always have to try and change the boundaries to make earning God's favor a little bit more attainable. And so we tell ourselves, I'll be okay as long as I keep the basic meaning of the command. For, for example, we hear the word of God, thou shalt not kill. And we pat ourselves in the back and we say, well, well, I'm no murderer. I've never killed anyone. But an important principle we'll see as we go through these commands is that these 10 commandments merely give the summary. They are given in a very concise form. And each commandment is actually much, much more encompassing than we like to appreciate. And you see that in Scripture. Take, take Matthew 5, for example, and, and you see how Christ saw the law of God. He took the commandment, thou shalt not kill, and he brought out the point that not only did it forbid men from literally killing in cold blood, it also addressed the heart of men. It also forbids men from unjust anger. It challenges the words of man and the hateful talk of man. The Lord was pointing out there where there's anger in the heart even. You've become a breaker of that law. He did the same with the commandment concerning adultery. He applied it to the heart. He taught that it forbids even the inward feeling of, of lust toward another person. So, so these commands, all of them will go far beyond the basic initial sense on the page. And we've Got legitimate reason for saying that. That's how Christ used the law of God. And so as we come to these different commandments, whichever one we come to, and we recognize that, we're actually never able to pat ourselves on the back and to say, you know, I think I've done all right on this one. Every time as we take time with these commands and turn to them and examine ourselves by them, every time it, it ought to be like lifting a rock and we're uncovering all sorts of dark creatures that are still wriggling there in our hearts. We're discovering more and more that things are not right, that, that we are lawbreakers, that we haven't kept this law, that we haven't even come close to doing all right. When we see the commands like that, it emphasizes to us there is never a time when we have kept nine commandments and only broken one. We've broken every single command on the list. We've broken them all. We have not obeyed all that is written. We haven't obeyed any that is written. Never mind not obeying all that is written. So as well as we might tell ourselves we've done, if we're trying to approach God that way, we're under the curse. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written. So you could think of our shortcoming in, 
in terms of completeness. We, we haven't fulfilled all the law. You could think of our shortcoming in terms of, I'll say, commission, activity. Uh, we have a shortcoming in terms of our activity. Notice in verse 10, uh, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, to do them. Now again, the law is much more substantial than we realize. And, and here's another principle as we will take in the commands that God has given. We're often prone to think of the commandments as negative. You know, don't do this thing. Don't do that thing. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal and so on. Avoid these sins and you'll be all right then is how we interpret that. You know, what we'll discover is that the law calls for not just the avoiding of sinful activity, but it actually calls for the positive doing of that which is good. You know, that, that's why in Ephesians 4 verse 28, and believers are told, let him that stole, steal no more. And it doesn't stop there. It says, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. The law there, thou shalt not steal, not only demands the avoiding of theft, but it also involves positively caring for the property and well-being of others, working with the hands, the thing that is good. There's a, there's a positive activity that is also commanded along with the negative. The commands then don't just say, leave those things alone. The commands of God also tell us, do these things. Live for God in these particular ways. And again then, how far short we fall. Because even if, as you sit here today, you can assess your whole history and you can say, you know what, I've never stolen something from a shop. Well, well done for that. But I think we all have to confess that there have been many times when we have not shown the care and concern that we ought to have shown, and even perhaps given practical help to people around us in their desperate need. In fact, earlier I mentioned those cursed of Matthew 25, who are told to depart into everlasting fire. You know, one of the things that they are condemned for is in verse 42 of that chapter, Matthew 25, verse 42. Christ gives the, a list of things, of big problems in their lives. He says, for I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. Now, if you take a very shallow view of the law of God, they might turn to the Lord and say, well, so what? I was never commanded to do that. I didn't steal from you, so I was all right. Well, Christ sees it different. I was hungered, ye gave me no meat. Uh, I was thirsty, ye gave me no drink. See, there was an expectation of positive righteousness as well as just avoiding the sin. And that went hand in hand with them being ultimately said, told, depart from me, ye cursed. They were condemned for their hard heart in refusing to do the commands of God. So we have this shortcoming in terms of our, our conduct and our, our commission of, of that which is good. And then... As if all of that isn't enough, you could also think about our shortcoming in terms of consistency. Again, Galatians 3 verse 10, you'll see that this curse is for everyone that continueth not in the law. It's for everyone who does not continue, who does not go on in keeping the law. It emphasizes that theme of consistency. So if you're trying to get close to God on the basis of your goodness and your your law keeping well it better be perfect law keeping for a start and it better be absolutely consistent all the way through your life with no failure to continue in it whatsoever and again which of us can say that maybe there's moments when we well we, we think and I stress that we think we've kept all the law of God but certainly it hasn't been the continual thing right the way through our lives now wrap this all together and the point is that the law exposes us as a people totally undone. The notion of getting to God through our good works, through law keeping, through being good enough in ourselves, it is never going to work because we fall short. Our best is not good enough. In fact, our best is deserving of God's curse. 
Uh, and then, let's be very clear too about the certainty with which this curse is received. Because if you look again at verse 10, notice the words, cursed is every one. All who submit to, submit to this system, all who fail in it, which is everyone, all receive this curse. The curse is for everyone in that boat. You know, we're all aware of problems in our legal systems at times. You know, we're, we're conscious that sometimes the, the wealthy can pay for the best lawyers and find legal loopholes and get themselves off the hook in a way that perhaps those who can't afford the best lawyers aren't able to do. We're conscious of that. We're very conscious around this world too that in various places you know, there's corruption and there are judges who would be willing to take bribes and you can use your money just to get yourself out of trouble. But let's be very clear, no one gets off the hook when it comes to breaking God's law. As you try to approach God through this means, law-keeping, being good enough, and you come and you stand before God on the final day and you're measured by that law which you've been trying to obey all your life, you'll fall short and you will receive the curse. No exceptions will be made for you. No exceptions will be made for the one who gets close. The curse will be for all. And so as we proceed to study the law of God, one of the things to be driven into our hearts is that we do not measure up in the smallest degree and there is no free pass for us. We're in desperate trouble if we remain in that position as lawbreakers before God. We're in trouble. Stay there and every one of us is totally without hope. But there is hope in this passage. And we want to finish by taking that in. Taking the, yes, the solemn message of verse 10 and the, the serious consequences that, that that holds out to us as we try to be good enough in ourselves and we earn the curse. But also notice in, in this passage, notice the rescue from this curse. If what we've been looking at so far today is all that we had to work with, then this would be a, a very bitter study. Not just the message today, but the whole number of weeks we, ahead as we look through the particular commandments of God and we see all that's required of us and all the ways in which we fall short. If this is all we had to work with, it is a bitter study. It is the most depressing study in all the world because each week as we come to each new commandment, it'll reveal new problems in our hearts and in our lives and each new commandment will reveal all the more guilt that we have before God and each new commandment will come to us like a nail being driven all the further down into our coffin. It would be the most bitter and depressing and miserable study ever. But the important thing to remember is that God's word does not present us with the commands of God in isolation. Instead, God gives his commandments in connection with providing us a way of salvation. Here in Galatians 3, we mentioned it already, there are two systems given for trying to draw near to God. Two systems, not one. And we're being warned here about the curse of the law and the dreadful end of those who try to use this system and and get to God through their works and their law keeping. We're being warned about this so that we might realize how hopeless that path is and that we might approach God in a totally different way through faith. You know, even in the Old Testament, God gave his law so as to force his people to rest in him and come to him by faith. You know, even in Exodus, as God gave the threatening warnings of the law, God also gave the sacrificial system. He gave the specifications for the tabernacle and for all that was to go on there with the priests and the sacrifices and, and the bloodshed and all, all the rest. And all of it was pointing to a different way in which Israel could approach onto God. You know, at Sinai, God was not just giving Israel a, a covenant of works. He was not just saying, right, here it is, do this and through law keeping, you will earn my favor and live before me. No, God was giving this law, showing them how impossible it was to earn his favor in that way and forcing them to rely on this other method. This, this method that for them shone forth through the tabernacle and the sacrifices that, that were offered, the blood that was shed to pay the price for sin uh, and to give them forgiveness with God. God was forcing them to lean on that system, to 
use the sacrifices and look by faith to his promises. And of course, we don't do that today, but we have the fullness of all that was held out in those sacrifices. We have Christ himself and his work here in the passage, along with giving the threatening warnings of the law. God gives us an incredible message of a wonderful savior. Verse 13 tells us in this context of the law and the curse of the law and how we've earned it through falling short. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. I said earlier that our default position is to be under the law. That's how we start in life and we start as lawbreakers. Under the law, we come under its curse. We are recipients. We are to be recipients of that curse. It is due to us. It is to come upon us. And therefore, our great need, your great need and mine, is to be redeemed. That is, bought back from the curse of the law. We need to be bought back from that curse. We need a price to be paid so that we can be set free from that curse. And God has an answer for us. It's wrapped up in this person, Christ. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, if you're a believer today, rejoice in verse 13, especially in light of what we've just looked at. Here's a dreadful curse that was hanging over your head, death, destruction, eternal ruin, every blessing, everything that you enjoy stripped away, all good gone. Here's what you deserved. Here's what was coming your way. You had earned it through your failure, but God has an answer for you. Christ hath redeemed you from the curse of the law. This is God's answer. While we were without hope, cursed and lost, God sent his only begotten son into the world. Jesus Christ came to pay that necessary price and buy us back from the curse. And you'll notice how the Savior does that. Notice how he deals with your curse. Verse 13 tells us, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. You know, when the Savior came to rescue us, it was not as easy as simply telling us, you know, that old system of law keeping, set it to the side. Don't, don't, don't use that. It's not getting you anywhere. Just, just set that to the side and come to God through me. It wasn't as straightforward as that. See, we were under that system of the law, and not only that, but we had broken the law. We had failed to live up to its obligations. We had disobeyed its stipulations. We had earned the curse that it held out. And that curse had to be paid. We can't just break the law here, there, and everywhere, earn the curse and say, okay, I'll, I'll use something else, set that to the side. That, that curse can just hang over there somewhere. No, that curse rests upon you as a lawbreaker, as one who has failed to live up to God's standard. That curse rests upon you. You can't just set it to the side. And Christ can't tell you, just, just set that to the side and forget about it and come and trust me. It had to be paid. The wrath of God had to come against your disobedience. It had to come against your sin and mine. So you can't just set it to the side and take a different route. Christ, in saving you, if he's going to save you from the demands of the law, if he's going to save you in such a way that you avoid the curse, he had to bear it. He had to. And that's exactly what he did. Amazingly, verse 13 tells us that the Savior redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. Paul quotes from Deuteronomy 21 and verse 23, and he says, For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now, under the, the Old Testament Mosaic law, if a man had committed a serious crime worthy of death, then after the criminal was executed, his body was put upon a tree and it hung there. And all the world could look upon that dead body and see the shame of that person. All would look upon the body and they would say to themselves, there is the one who died cursed by God. There is the one who died under the curse of the law. They got what they deserved. There they are hanging now in shame because of their guilt. Well, Paul takes that language and he makes the parallel to Christ who was put upon a wooden cross. And there he was hanging, put to an open shame, hanging until he died. And everyone looking at Christ on that middle cross, 
at, at, at the hill. Everyone looking on him could say, surely there's the one dying under God's curse. In fact, they effectively did say that. His enemies rejoiced and they mocked him and they said, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him if he will have him. If he will have him. If God will have him, let, let him deliver him. For he said, I am the son of God. And effectively they were saying, look and see. He claimed to be the son of God. He claimed that the father delighted in him. Well, let God save him if God will have him. And their idea is, God will not have him. Look at him there as he dies, cursed by God. Look at him there as he dies in shame. He's accursed. And you know they were partly right. They were partly right because Christ was there bearing the curse. He was accursed. He was made a curse. That's why he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he's forsaken because he's bearing the curse of a lawbreaker like you or me. Now, when Paul presents in Galatians this, this other system of coming unto God, not by our righteousness, not by our law keeping, not by our strength, which can only earn the curse, but instead by faith. Particularly, we're being urged to come unto God by faith in this particular Savior, this person who has gone to that cross and who has borne your curse. And what an astonishing thing that is. You think of it, that God was made flesh to bear your curse. The God whom you have offended in so many ways was made flesh to bear your curse. And he has done it. And today you can be free from the curse simply through faith in him. Now, if you don't know Christ today, then you really need to tremble in fear and in terror, especially as we proceed through our study of the law of God. Because it calls for you to be cursed. It calls for your destruction. You would need to tremble. But for the Christian whose faith is in Christ, yes, there's going to be some bitterness as we go through the commandments of God because we will see the, the traces of sin that are still left there in our hearts and within us and the various things that are offensive to our God and the ways that we fall short. We will see some of that. And there's a bitterness there. But there will also be for us the, the sweetness of knowing that though these things would bring a curse upon us, we have a Savior who has first loved us and borne that curse. There is a Savior who has taken it away, who has stood in our place, and, and in him we come unto God. In fact, notice what it says in verse 14. Because Christ bore the curse of lawbreakers like us, it talks about the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham can come on the Gentiles, on the nations, on people like, like you and me. We can receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The blessing that Abraham enjoyed was the blessing of knowing God, the blessing of knowing God's salvation, the blessing of being justified with sins forgiven. That's what Paul emphasizes in verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Well, as you come unto God, not through law-keeping, but through faith in the law-keeper, Christ, and the one who died under the curse of that law for you, as you come to God through him, you are blessed today as a child of God. Not cursed like you deserve, blessed by the grace of God. So how do you stand before the law? Do you stand today still without Christ, still under the law and under its terrifying curse, your everlasting soul in great danger, hell on the horizon? Or can you rejoice today with, with thanksgiving and gladness and joy in your heart to Christ? Because through him, you're not under the law anymore. You're not. You're not under that system, that is. We don't disregard the law, but, but you're not under that system. You don't have to follow that system to earn your own way. You're freed from that. You don't need to do this and do that and do the other thing to earn your keep with God anymore. Christ is your righteousness today. Christ has borne your curse. Your, your acceptance with God is wrapped up with him. 
So which is it for you? Law keeping or faith? Curse or blessing? Everlasting death or everlasting life? I trust today that you know the blessing of being free from the law and free from its curse through faith in the one who bore that curse. And you can know the joy of that freedom today because today you're invited to rest in Jesus Christ, to look on to him with faith. And he who bore the curse is willing and able to save you from it. May God draw us to Christ and give us a heart for him and freedom in him. Let's pray together.